Hi, folks. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate Hi. you being here today. How you doing? Good? <laughs> Fired up. Great. <laughs> so for those of you who uh, don't know anything about Grantland or haven't heard of Grantland, uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. We are a daily content website uh, owned and operated by ESPN, but also living in our very own universe here in Los Angeles. Um, the goal of the site is to find ways to make culture and sports work together for an audience. Uh, we have a series of features and a series of blogs that we're running on a daily basis. And some of the very best writers on the internet contributing every day, some of them you see before you. Um, and you know, we're in our third year, we're approaching our third year, and uh, we really have a defined audience at this point, and that's something we're gonna talk a little bit about today. But one of the core ideas at Grantland is covering television in an aggressive and thoughtful way from our perspective. So I just wanna talk a little bit about that. Uh, on the panel today, to your far left, to my far left, uh, Chris Ryan. In the center is uh, in the center is Tess Lynch. Hi. And nearest to me is Emily Oshida. So, in conversation about this panel, we we're trying to figure out why exactly Grantland should be before you. And I think one of the reasons that we're doing that is because. TV is so important to us, and the way that we experience TV we feel is fairly unique, maybe even somewhat progressive. So I want to throw it to Chris to start to talk a little bit about how television and the way that we watch television, especially keeping in mind the audience that we have, has changed, say, in the last three to five years. Yeah, I think that um, one of the major things that you have to look at when you're thinking about uh, the way TV has changed and our consumption of TV has changed is definitely the introduction of the second screen and this idea that you're not only watching or having an experience watching television at home, but you're having an experience with the community. And whether that's the people who you're interacting with on Twitter or any other social media forum, I think that what we've kind of been experiencing over the last year or so in our coverage at Grantland when we talk about television is this blurring of the way our, our role as an audience has affected the shows themselves, if that makes any sense. So basically, this need almost for shows to satisfy urges that come out of participating on social media. Yeah, I mean, Tess, when, you, when you're watching a TV show, are you holding an iPad? Are you holding your phone? Well, first of all, can everyone hear us OK? <laughs> OK, good, just checking. Um, I, yes, I think that I, along with probably everyone here, there is a social aspect now to watching television. Um, I'm in a very small percentage of people who is not caught up with Game of Thrones, for instance, and it means that I feel, it's FOMO, I guess, is, is what it amounts to. Does everybody um, know what FOMO is? Fear of fear missing of out. out. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I definitely tune in, you know, with social media when I'm watching something, especially live. Um, one thing that, you know, definitely adds to the experience, especially for watching things like Survivor and, you know, event kind of programming is the fact that you can feel a part of a conversation. And there, you really are left out of that conversation if you don't participate. And it is kind of thrilling and an adrenaline rush sometimes to be able to participate. It, it does feel like a conversation. Yeah, and I, I'd say there's probably, it's sort of stratified between shows that you feel like you need to be a part of that conversation with and shows where you can kind of watch them whenever you want. Like obviously the rise of on demand for TV has been a huge thing in TV. and. There are certain shows where you can you watch them at your own speed. If you want to binge watch something in the privacy of your home and just shut off the computer and don't talk to anybody and then come out, you know, pasty and you know, uh, with your eyes red, <laughs> then that's your that's your call. But there are certain shows like Game of Thrones, like award shows, where those are the ones that really benefit from social media being such a big part of how we watch TV now. How do you guys figure out which shows you absolutely have to watch when they're airing and which shows? can roll to your DVR or you can watch at your leisure? I think that there's been a couple of, what we've seen in the last couple of years, I think, right, is the, the rise in supremacy of the Sunday night shows back, back on HBO, where, uh, whether, or HBO and, and AMC, where you feel like if you don't start watching that show, as soon as it starts, you're somehow going to miss out on an experience and also have it, the plot spoiled for you. Um, I think that there are certain shows like Bat Breaking Bad, True Detective, Game of Thrones that definitely um, like breed a certain kind of viewer. And even though there are texts that you can read that find out what had already happened on Game of Thrones if you wanted to, 
It's just the stakes are too high to miss out on a Sunday night. Whereas something like, say, Justified or some of the other shows that might be on, actually more midweek even, uh, I think you can kind of accumulate some of those and watch them later. I also think that sustaining a week-long conversation is a tough thing for a show to do. And, you know, for instance, True Detective uh, was such an immersive show, and there was also so much to unpack. It created its own content on the second screen. I mean, there were, there were whole offshoots of theories and essays and really thought-provoking things that took time to write, took time to digest. And if you kind of waited to watch True Detective, you were left scrambling to, to get up to speed with everyone else who was commenting. And I think True Detective was probably, for our site, the guinea pig, right? Like, that was the one where it kind of started while we had had our sea legs writing about television. And it was only one of the first shows to sort of emerge since Grantland, I think. Yeah. And we sort of found ourselves, after a few episodes, we were, you know, into the show. It was definitely very high quality. But it was after the third or fourth episode that we realized there was this phenomenon around the show about thinking about the show, theorizing about how it was going to end, who was the Yellow King, if you watch the show. I mean, there was so much going on around it that it became its own industry almost. Yeah, and Emily, we, can you tell a little bit about like how specifically we covered the show and what that what that meant for the site? Yeah, so we uh, well recently for uh, for example for these big shows like True Detective, like Game of Thrones, the ones that can generate that kind of conversation that lasts all week, we've started doing what we call a precap, which I mean initially might have made some people's eyes roll, but I mean it's the kind of thing though that would make a lot of uh, that would generate a lot of conversation on, and we would run it the Friday before that weekend that the show was on, and it's sort of just to get everybody hyped up about a show that they really like. And it, the comment sections in those become a place where people just bounce ideas off of each other and just you know have a big kind of fan fest. And so that was sort of something we started doing with those big shows. But I mean, we, we kind of we, we tailor it to the show. For example, we have a column for Game of Thrones fans that runs like the Tuesday after the show runs. And it's basically getting down to the really nitty gritty about the books in a spoiler free way. Uh, for people who watch the episode and have questions about it. It's called Ask the Maester. I mean, we, we kind of figure out what each show demands coverage-wise that our readers would be interested in, and it's different for each show. Yeah, all, all three of these guys also uh, host podcasts on Grantland's Podcast Network, and that's also a big part of driving the conversation about television. Maybe you guys could t talk a little bit about maybe some of the anxiety you feel about getting involved in the conversation. You know, Chris, Chris uh, hosts a podcast with Andy Greenwald, our lead TV writer. That usually runs when Monday nights, Tuesday mornings. You guys run a midweek podcast, so there's the, the conversation in a way has kind of shifted over that time. Maybe you can talk about how you prepare. It's feast or famine. Uh, we just, Andy and I just got done a two-month stretch where we had nothing to talk about, which made for an exciting podcast. And, uh, and now we have too much to talk about. We, we pretty much spend... 45 minutes every Monday breaking down Game of Thrones and Mad Men. Um, as far as being part of the conversation, I think that there, there are these two layers. Like I, like, I personally am really into just reading the, the shows as text as they are, but then there is a conversation to have about the conversation, and you've seen a lot of that, uh, for instance, with True Detective and the role of women on the show and whether or not there were any substantive parts for any of the female actresses on the show. And that becomes its own conversation, and it becomes almost a meta discussion of what television is doing right now and how television interacts with society. So I tend to, to veer for the, towards the former, but the latter is definitely a really viable and vibrant conversation right now. Yeah, I'd say that on our podcast, which usually runs on Thursdays, we kind of end up picking a lot of that conversation about the conversation because it's been a few days since the episode's come out. A lot of that conversation that's just about the events of a show sort of run its course, so we kind of are positioned in a place where we can talk more about what a show means in a larger sense in culture. Um, and it kind of makes for a little bit of a diversity between all the podcasts on the network. Yeah. Do you guys find that you're workshopping ideas for pieces in the podcasts? Like, does that ever, does, is there ever an idea born in that conversation? I'd say so. I, I think, think I'm probably the audience for the workshopping of pieces. Right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think our, our podcast is called Girls in Hoodies. and. Um, you know, throughout, the, we've been doing it for a little over a year now, and I, I'd say that there's sort of a, there's a girls in hoodies mentality that has sort of come up, like, accidentally, just from all of us having a conversation every week. Molly Lambert is the third member of our podcast, and, uh, and yeah, I would say that more often than not, I've had ideas for things, or realize that there's a conversation to be had about something, like something that I assumed was just 
something everybody thought about, you know, that episode of that show. Uh, I've, I realized that I had a disagreement with somebody about it, and then that brings up all sorts of new things to write about. So, yeah, they kind of inform each other. I also think that when you have a podcast where you are, you know, it is heavily influenced by feedback from the audience that you're speaking to and the audience of these niche shows, I think what it also kind of allows us to do is almost try to find tangents that would apply, you know, for instance, if we're talking about Mad Men, to think what else is out there, you know, that we watch, you know, from obscure things to, to things from a while ago that we can kind of bring into that conversation to enhance that content, to make it richer. Um, because especially having a podcast that's later in the week, it gives you a little bit more time to think through, OK, what is our audience looking for from this conversation that's different from what they might look for a, a Monday podcast, for instance? Yeah, you do get feedback from time to time, I, I fairly, fairly regularly, about like, well, I really can't wait till you guys address this scene or this incident or this event on this show, um, which is really interesting because it, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how quickly consensus is formed among audiences that certain things matter and certain things don't. Um, and, and you find yourself more often than not being led by that, that kind of audience response. And it's also a site where there are really, I think that the readers have a especially good sense of the writers and their personalities and what's important to them and where their, their thoughts tend to go about certain topics. So there are situations where it's like, that's something I really want to hear Andy talk about, or that's something I really want to hear Wesley Morris talk about. Like it's, it's uh, I think that the writer, the writer emphasis on Grantland in general really helps for that. You know, uh, Emily talked a little bit about the precaps that we do on Fridays for specific shows that we're really invested in. Obviously, we're sort of in the middle of a phase now where uh, for dramatic TV shows, recaps are in kind of a curious state and the, the culture of recapping television shows um, is sort of in a middle period. Kind of briefly talk about maybe the history of how this stuff has kind of come about. Yeah, sure, why don't you tell us? Yeah, so I mean, just, just to give you guys a sense in case you're, you're not uh, grabbing this, it's, there was a, uh, a kind of culture on the internet, it, I would say maybe early 2000s probably came up, especially around a website called Television Without Pity which was one of the early sort of pop culture websites. RIP. And they would, yeah, and it was recently <laughs> shut, down. shut down, yeah. Um, where they would do these recaps that were fairly granular retellings of the plot of television shows. So X character did Y act or whatever. And that was actually literally for people who may have missed an episode of Felicity or missed an episode of Star Trek Next Generation or whatever it happened to be. That sort of has mutated over the years into uh, the rise of television critics. You see the importance of people like Emily Nussbaum at The New Yorker, Andy at our site, uh, Matt Zoller sites at New York Magazine, who have sort of elevated the art of television criticism to more something cl closer akin to what film criticism is for us when you think about, a, say, a Roger Ebert or a David Denby at The New Yorker. Um, and that has kind of led to what we kind of jokingly, or not no jokingly, but we refer to inside of the office as like sort of the think piece industry where people are writing these mini essays about themes that are coming out of one or more shows and often are not sticking to straight narrative recapping of the shows. Um, and since then, and recently, we've started doing these things called precaps, which are almost previews for these shows that are coming up. Right. So think piece is kind of a somewhat of a dirty word editorially for us because there's a, a hint of pretentiousness involved. And, but at the same time, we are definitely. You should be thinking about every piece. Yeah, we are, we're in the think piece business, <laughs> full stop. Um, but can you guys talk a little bit about that? Not just the way that we talk about it, but whether when you're formulating an editorial idea, if it somehow feels too much in that space? Well, I think, I think on our site particularly, we've tried to teach our audience, I guess that also sounds really obnoxious, but we tried to, <laughs> we tried to you know, find a way to, to start a conversation that isn't necessarily just about a review or a recap of an episode. And it's funny because a lot of times you'll write a piece about a show and it's not a review and it's not a recap it's digging into some you know other idea that came up in the course of the show and you know you'll see comments or tweets or something that be like oh yeah great review or like terrible review and it's like it's not we we're not really i don't think you can call what it is a review and i don't know if i want to call it a think piece either but it's uh, but it's something it's something that exists beyond the idea of whether a show was good or bad or what happened on it like kind of always asking the questions about what it means either for the TV industry in general or you know, just narratively from a more film-like criticism. So I think there's 
I don't I mean, know if that answers your question. <laughs> I, I also think that the difference between you know a, a, an older form of recap and what we try to do is we assume that people have seen the shows we're talking about and are familiar with them. And I think with television, what's happening is you know, there's more respect for the audience members. They, they're being assumed to be smarter than they were. Uh, we, I think, speak to a very smart readership. Um, the feedback that we get come, is very intelligent and very challenging sometimes for us because our readers, you know, there are readers, one or two, who are smarter than we are. Uh, <laughs> so we assume a high level of intelligence and that really directs us in how we talk about programming. Um, we assume that people want to dig really deep into these shows. We assume that they want to discover more programming that might interest them. We want to assume that they are watching and also watching on the second screen looking for different ways to engage themselves in the world, you know, in a fictional world. I really think that the, the speed at which this has all changed in, I would even say the last few years has been kind of breathtaking. I mean, the idea now that um, there's just basically an experience on, I think, Wednesdays called Scandal Twitter, where it's just people watching Scandal tweeting about it, and it is its own entire subsection of, of Twitter, and, it, and it, it's, it's breeded its own entire subsection of the internet to some extent. That wasn't around in 2011, you know what I mean, 2010. This just wasn't happening. To think back what would have happened if Twitter had been around, really been around during Lost, is kind of a, it's kind of, you know, you, you dare to imagine what would have <laughs> happened on Lost if there had been Twitter. Especially because now you also have showrunners who are engaging with their audience on Twitter. And I guarantee you, I know for a fact that they do read what people are saying and that they do incorporate some of what people are saying into their into their writing. There's, there's a little bit of voodoo that takes place in trying to figure out when a show has really taken off, like when True Detective has officially become yeah. a show in this pantheon, or some, even something like American Horror Story, if it's having a particularly crazy season, or, or uh, you know, even Scandal, like Chris talked about. How do you guys know when something has really taken off? What, do you, what is the number one tool that you use? Is it Twitter? Is it the number of pieces that have been written about something? Is it audience feedback? I don't know if it's Twitter so much as it's like a specific subset of Twitter, which is like a memification, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the thing that really started to tip me off that True Detective was going to be huge was just how many jokes there were. <laughs> like, I, I, and it's the same with Game of Thrones too, which Game of Thrones is a really fun joke to just, or a really fun show to just tell jokes about for 20 minutes. We've done it on podcasts before, but <laughs> um, but I think once. Once a show feels like something kind of pliable like that, that people want to, you know, kind of hold in their hands and mess with for a week's long, a week's worth of material, then that's, I think that's when you realize you have one of those shows. Yeah. Well, talk about the downside of that, though. You know, True Detective has come up a lot here, but there are a lot of shows where we really get ginned up about what's going to happen in the next episode, and a lot of times those expectations are not met. Well, I think what you were talking about, you know, one way of looking at it would be when your appreciation or when the public's appreciation for a television show shifts from private to public. When does it make the leap out of your email account and onto a social media account? When it is something you like, want to share about? Mm -hmm. And there's an inevitable loss involved in that, right? Like, there's an inevitable loss of, like, this is no longer just something special that I have for myself that I enjoy. This is something that I expect to share with other people. There could be an enrichment that comes along with it. You can enjoy the show in a way more, but it, it doesn't feel as private anymore. Does that, is that true for you guys too? Because I think that there is kind of a generational element there in play where before the internet, if you grew up in a time when it didn't exist and you couldn't share your feelings to everyone all the time, you know, a seven inch record or an obscure movie felt more special because you couldn't yeah. find anything about them. Now, if you have deep feelings about a somewhat small show, there's inevitably a lot of places to go. So I mean, do you guys still feel the same way as Chris? Yeah, I mean, well, the last season of Breaking Bad was, I feel, I'm a little salty about it. I, I mean, I, I was one of those people that, you know, was in on that show when it still was kind of finding its audience a little bit, and I was trying to tell everybody about it, and then, oh my god, the show is so great. And of course, by the last season, I mean, everybody saw it, it was huge. It was a major cultural event, the, the final, I guess, half season of Breaking Bad. And the conversation around it just... For me, it got to be too much. It was not interesting to me. It wasn't interesting to me to guess who was going to die at the end of the season. Like, that's not what I got into that show for, and that's not if I was going to write something about that show, which I don't actually think I ended up doing that. I mean, that that's the other thing, is you can have a show ruined for you just by the act of writing about it. I know that Andy talks about that a lot, our, our main TV critic, because uh, he's, he, I think, he, he said 
uh, Mad Men's his number one show right now. Excuse right? me. Mad Men's his his number one right now. Oh yeah, I think. So. Yeah, but he, I mean, he doesn't he doesn't have to recap it. Uh, Molly Lambert does, uh, one of our other writers, and I think that that's something that comes up a lot. That, that the act of having to sit down and you know for four hours or something and write a recap of something or a review. Um, can take some of the fun out of it, the the enjoyment of, of just watching a show that you like. Um, so you have to be a little careful. I disagree, but <laughs> <laughs> that, that's also because, as Sean mentioned, I'm an American horror story fanatic, and uh, and I one of the things that I really love about the internet is its ability to foster niche communities and to, you know, you can kind of find your space no matter what your space is. Uh, so for me. I think a lot of the time uh, I find that my enjoyment of a show is actually elevated by being more involved. I got so deep into the true detective conspiracy hole uh, that I'm shamed, but I'm admitting it anyway. Uh, it, I was absolutely convinced that I knew the answer and then I was reading Reddit and it, I found that it added an excitement um, that I might not have otherwise had. Let's change gears a little bit, guys. Um, you know, we're talking about shows and second screen and. You know, another element here is uh, sort of the live event experience. Um, obviously, sports is a big part of what Grantland does, and it's also a big part of this conversation. Likewise, for award shows, things that are happening in a one-time only fashion. Obviously, NBC had a big moment last year with The Sound of Music, or perhaps earlier this year. Um, you know, do you guys make that appointment viewing as well, and do you engage in the same way? I mean, obviously, with sports, it's part of my job. so. That's something that I do, but I have noticed even with these NBA playoffs that have been on the last couple of weeks, they almost feel like Sunday night television now. Uh, you will be sitting around, your phone will buzz, and somebody will be start just saying LeBron or James Harden. A player's name will just start popping up on your phone repeatedly, and you find yourself gravitating towards a television set. I think that that was always the case, but you could always, before I think you were like, I'll just catch it on Sports Center, I'll catch the highlight later. There's something about the pull of social media that's making, and it especially is true for live events, I think, where even somebody like me who I don't think I could hum a Sound of Music song, that, that kept popping up on my Twitter feed so much that I felt compelled to turn it on. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say that those are situations where it, it really almost is like having a physical party with friends. It's, an, it's such an extremely social and unique kind of event uh, that, yeah, I, I watched Sound of Music, I watched it with phone in hand. It felt, it, it would not have been possible really to get what everyone else was getting out of it mm -hmm. without the second screen, I yeah. think. And I think, especially for award shows, I mean, I, I, in general, I think that there, there's no point now <laughs> to watch them if it's not, it, it, without the social interaction, uh, because at least for, from an entertainment Standpoint. I mean, it's like having a second writer's room for yeah. the monologue. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, if the jokes are a little lackluster, just go to Twitter and you'll probably, you know, laugh a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously, we have to watch these events anyway on TV because of our job and because they're newsworthy. But I think from just a purely entertainment standpoint, it's, uh, it's a lot more fun <laughs> with Twitter, even if you're not tweeting, just reading stuff. Yeah, Chris, can you talk a little bit about Red Zone and what that's done for football? Yeah, it's, it's definitely um, shredded my short attention span capabilities, for one thing. Uh, NFL Red Zone has been something that, you know, because still, for a lot of people, the NFL is something you either have to go to a bar to watch or you have to have direct TV to watch because of the package. Um, but uh, NFL Red Zone has not only changed people's access to their teams, I think it's changed people's relationships to sports in general. Um, anybody who has spent a day watching four to eight hours of pretty much nothing but high octane plays and important plays in NFL games will feel like they have a greater understanding of what's happening in the league and at the same time have no understanding of what's happening in the league. And I think that there's a parallel to actually like everything that we're talking about here is that we're, maybe we at once always feel like we have this great, greater grasp of a conversation while at the same time are maybe not saying exactly what we want to be saying. Um, it, there, it's, it's a strange byproduct of this entire experience. Yeah, it still feels unfinished. I was thinking about if there's an application, like a red zone application to any other version of culture. Like, will there ever be a time when you only get the kills on The Walking Dead? Yeah, you know what I mean? sure. I'm Didn't we talk about that at Coachella? Just like being able to watch a festival and only watch the, the best like guests. You can, you can do it on YouTube. That's you true, on YouTube, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but in a way you just want to drill down to the single best yeah. performance just from each Tell me what I need yeah. to know about, you know, these three days. Um, 
I think yeah. in, in a way some of that some of the premium television that you see going on with Showtime and HBO and, ABC and AMC, and especially with True Detective where they're moving to a miniseries model and there's just six to eight episodes, you used to have to watch 22 episodes or something. I mean, now it's like they're really fire, like filing this stuff down to the point where what is the most important eight hours of this show that we need to give you? Mm -hmm. It's funny because I feel like people talk a lot today about how there's too much TV and there are too many shows you have to keep track of and that you know a lot of episodes will fall by the wayside for certain things. But then you do have a show like True Detective that comes around every, every now and again where people will watch that two or three times, like rewatch an episode. It demands that kind of attention and you know, you may have, you know, 15 other shows on your DVR, but like you really like when it comes to True Detective, you're going to like analyze that to like the microsecond. And so I think I think that there is that attention span still out there for things. And it just takes the right kind of show to get it. I remember at the uh, about halfway through the first season of Mad Men, a lot of people in New York where I was living at the time were having Mad Men themed parties. They were dressing up and they were making uh, highballs and they were speaking uh, in ridiculous accents. Um, and it feels like that has sort of come apart as the internet has taken more primacy in, in, in the conversation. Like, do you guys still watch shows with people or is it a very you know, insular experience? There's no talking. If you come over to my, <laughs> to my house to watch Game of Thrones, you can't talk. Not because it's like, like that, it, I mean, it's obviously a very well-made show, but I mean, it's more that I won't understand what happens on that show if anybody talks during it. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't watch shows with, with people that much anymore. I used to think that that was like a really fun thing to do, especially like I remember like middle of Breaking Bad, I would have friends over to watch that. But now it's like, especially because you know of our work and having to, you know, usually have to edit something or like do something else after it. It's like it's work time, kind of. You know, that it's more fun than that, but it's work time. <laughs> and I think Twitter and you know social media has kind of given us the ability to control our social interactions when we you know are turning our attention to a show like that. It's you know, I don't know if that's good or bad uh, to have that kind of control, but it is preferable if you're that engrossed to be able to look at a conversation when you can without shushing anyone. Right. You know, I mean, it's it's there. It waits for you. It works on your time, and it's not sitting next to you on the sofa giggling and interrupting and Cheetos everywhere. It's not that kind of thing. You know, I think we were going to talk about. I mean, at one point, I was I was kind of curious about hearing what everybody had to say about the disparity sometimes between the amount of importance we put on a show versus the amount it's actually watched by a larger mm -hmm. audience. And we've definitely found for our site, we have a, a, a lane we stay in. There's a niche audience that we serve and there's a niche way we write about television. But a lot of the shows that you've heard us talk about and a lot of the shows that you'll see on written about on the site are not top 10 shows. Uh, there's a lot to be determined about what the value of something like what we do and what uh, a show like, say, True Detective or Game of Thrones derives from the way people watch it versus the way people might watch an NCIS or, a, or a, a, another CBS procedural. But it's always kind of interesting to me. Sometimes there will be like a, a big episode of, of Game of Thrones and it'll get about what a normal episode of NCIS gets in terms of viewership. And it's always strange to try and find the perspective on what you're talking about there. Well, we had an interesting example of that because I don't think anybody up here is a, a watcher of The Good Wife, but there was obviously a, okay, Chris yeah. is, but there was a major moment on The Good Wife a few weeks ago, and we kind of found ourselves editorially a little hamstrung, because we were like, who's going to write about this? Yeah. How are we going to respond to this? Everybody was busy watching Game of Thrones. Watching right Game of Thrones, yeah. It's not something that we respond to in the same way we respond to these other shows that we really fetishize, and it's a weird problem to have. I mean, we did find somebody, and we did have a really smart piece about it, but um, you know, that's obviously a really quality show that a lot of people really like, and... For some reason, it, it is a little bit outside of our orbit, and I think there is a little bit of mystery as to how things become a part of the Grantland audience. There was a funny thing about that episode, if I remember correctly, too, was didn't it happen in between True Detective and Game of Thrones coming back? It took place in some weird dead zone between the like yeah. perfectly that we're scheduled. Used to watching it, like it would be as if like there, you know, there's there's a day in the summer where there actually are no sports played, and some major trade happened, and we all thought we had the day off, and in fact. <laughs> There was this huge piece of sports. I mean, we thought, no oh, off. this is a Sunday, Sunday night off. And it just so happened that something did take over. I think one of the luxuries we have at our site is that we don't necessarily have, like, we did find somebody to write about that, that Good Wife episode, but we, we don't necessarily have to. I think we've, we've really true. tailored an audience that 
knows that we are going to cover things that we really care about. We're not going to cover something just because it has you know, SEO power or something. And that's really liberating from the perspective of writers. And I think for the audience, hopefully they're just happy that they know that every time they see something on our site, it's written because the person writing it really cares about it and has something to say about it. I think that's the thing about think pieces. I mean, you have a lot of words. It, to, to be a think piece, there has to be some substance there. And it's very hard to fabricate that if you don't care, I think. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that any of us are, are really interested in trying to cover something that we're not passionate about. And we want to be as passionate as our readers. Um, we don't want to phone it in or, you know, because that, that was back in the day, I think that when you were writing recaps for people who hadn't seen shows, it was what maybe one would call servicey, and it, it wasn't important that you have an opinion or something important to say uh, about it. But now I think that really is, you know, the the point of what we do. Yeah. You know, uh, we all watch reality television as well, which is far different from a lot of the shows we've been talking about, but is also extremely relevant in this conversation. Um, do you guys watch your reality shows with a, with a second screen? Do you do you engage in it in the same way? Do you go down the, the survivor rabbit holes, the Real Housewives rabbit holes? They really want you to. I mean, they put, they put the, the hashtags on you know, every five seconds yeah. on Survivor. I'm a Survivor person right now. I, I took a long extended break, and now I'm back in on it. And uh, I, I don't think I ever watched that show live, though. I think that that's a, that's a I, I do. I watch Bachelorette and Bachelor, and I watch those live because those shows, like an award show, are kind of a pain to watch unless you're you've got a stream of jokes coming in from other people who are watching it. Um, Survivor, I just kind of like, so <laughs> it doesn't matter when I watch it in the week. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I, it is a little bit cheesy, though. I mean, the 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 hashtag is how do you even say that? I've, I've written it out. Hashtagification. Yeah, hashtagification of reality shows or like what, you know, there's obviously somebody at these shows who says that, maybe it's you guys, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> who says that, uh, you know, that there has to be some kind of Twitter implementation into the shows. And I, I would be curious to see how many times, you know, like secret, hashtag secret spy shack is actually <laughs> tweeted. Spy shack. <laughs> spy shack. I saw that. Um, like on Twitter while that episode is airing because I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how that really helps the show or helps the audience, but somebody told somebody that there should be hashtags all over the screen. <laughs> Have any of you ever used one of those hashtags? No. no. Ironically. Oh, you know one. Ironically, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm a terrible person. <laughs> I think Survivor does, uh, does the hashtagification. It, I think they're working towards something. I mean, the Spy Shack, the spy was, shack was a pretty is, brilliant is thing. worthy, There's actually. There's a sense of humor <laughs> there that I think some of the shows are still working out. But I, I do think that that is a field where there's a lot of evolution to be seen. Uh, I think, you know, Top Chef being, having Last Chance Kitchen, for instance, having web shows that are complementary to the television show, That's it's smart, point. but it's still working out. You know, I mean, yeah. I know a lot of people who are Top Chef fanatics and they won't watch. It's, it, for them, it, it just seems, you know, like That's me. an accessory, really. Yeah. I won't watch Last Chance Kitchen. I mean, yeah, it just, you'll figure, it. you'll find it out. I mean, there's no information that is that important to the show that can be left out because right. they don't want to exclude you. So I think it's still something that we're trying to figure out how to really implement. I think one of the things that we've been talking about this entire time is this interesting relationship between the consumer of television, the programmers of television, and this nebulous third party that might be Twitter and it might be your DVR and it, mm -hmm. it's the it's the instrument through which you are, are participating with this conversation and I thought we were going to get up here and we would probably be get done and we would talk about how we're living in an age of of consumer choice and we all make these decisions about when to watch things and and how to talk about them but the more I hear us talk the more it sounds almost like we're still you know, sitting there on our couches at 8 p.m. sharp, like it was must-see TV in 1986 or something like that. <laughs> in a lot of ways, I mean, I know that there are nights where we're not, but when I'm thinking about my last two weeks between the NBA playoffs and all the Sunday night television and Survivor on Wednesday and all these things, like, I can't think of a night where I made my own call. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's something that's true for me too. I, I find that um, all television is event television at this yeah. point for me. It's very specifically plotted. I, I, I don't do as much flipping as I used to, I, if at I, all. We, you, Sean and I carpool into work, and I have heard him almost create, like you talk about the Comedy Central shows, yeah. and you've almost created in your mind like a, an aesthetic for them and, 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 and a need to see Kroll Show, Amy Schumer, uh, Key and Peele, like whatever, like pretty close to when they come out. 
Yeah, yeah, I feel like I'm missing out. I, it's actually sort of related to something that Tess was saying, which is, you know, Broad City was one of my favorite shows of the year so far, and uh, that was a show that was born out of the web and was a web series. And you know, web, the web is such a such a rich uh, minefield at this point. It's like very dangerous to try to figure out what's going to work on traditional television and what's not. I mean, do you guys watch any web series? No. I I watch. Uh, I have to recommend. Uh, I I believe it's called High Maintenance. Yeah. It's about uh, a marijuana delivery guy, and I I don't. I think it was being developed. I don't know if that uh, went through, but it's um it's kind of in the vein of I would say Louis the tone. Uh, it feels very like just condensed cable on the web. Uh, very high production value and a sort of a tone that's very hard to pin down. It doesn't feel like it belongs on the web. So I think that, and you know, we were big Broad City fans. Um, and I think that, that that has a similar thing. It's an unexpected tone and a freedom mm -hmm. that really translates well, I think, to cable. And do you think that's purely informed by it being born of the internet? I don't know if it is. I mean, I think, I think one thing that, for instance, I would also count girls in this category. I think that something that the internet offers is a, a real ability to have complete creative control. And I think that cable is the same kind of space for that. Um, I think that being able to give everyone a voice and the opportunity to ha be a part of this kind of meritocracy where they can create something that really will flo float to the top, essentially, uh, is, is something that, yeah, I mean, that definitely draws you into web programming. Do you guys think that? Do you think that somehow <coughs> the internet has created more freedoms for what airs on television? Uh, certainly. I mean, I think that we're also in a really interesting time for that because I think that there is this so-called, I mean, we, we, we sort of casually refer to it as the golden age of television that we're coming out of with Sopranos and Breaking Bad and Mad Men or these shows built around basically auteur showrunners like Matthew Weiner or uh, Vince Gilligan. And uh, now we're sort of in a strange place where you're seeing a lot of film directors coming to television and getting to do dream projects in small, on the small screen. So it's a very exciting point where I feel like it's never been more creative. Uh, I also just feel like it's never been more difficult to know that you're on top of everything. I mean, even now, with television as watching television as part of my job, I still get tweets from people like, have you checked out Vikings? Have you checked out Banshee? You guys haven't talked about uh, Louie in a while. Like, and I realize I'm falling behind, and I'm falling behind. I mean, that's really the modern television problem is, is, is constantly being behind. Yeah, I think we all feel that anxiety. Um, so I, what's the what? Go, go ahead. I was gonna say I, I just think that the I try not I, I I I think that there was probably a year period or something where I did feel a lot of anxiety about shows that I was missing, and then I kind of realized that at a certain point there's like diminishing returns for how much, especially if you have to write about things. If you are watching TV in every waking hour, you're not going to I think be able to think about it and write about it as intelligently. And I, I don't know, I think that there's like a, a middle point in there, but there, I don't, I, I'm at the point now where I'm not going to watch a show if it genuinely does not interest me. I would rather watch something that I have a passion about or at least find to be interesting, like a lot of reality TV shows. That's why I watch them. I, I find them to be interesting, so I don't know. Let's talk a little bit about um, the way forward and what's gonna happen in the future best guesses, obviously consumer programming essentially, this idea that what people want is what can appear um, is on the minds of a lot of people. Do you think that that's gonna be even more dominant going forward? I, I actually think the opposite. I mean, that maybe, I, maybe it's just recency bias because we're talking about it, but uh, on our podcast, Andy and I often talk about different brands. So the way, what FX shows feel like, what HBO shows feel like, what AMC shows feel like. Um, Andy often like will sort of get get wind of different companies, different networks getting into different kinds of content, and I kind of wonder whether or not that's just going to continue, and that we're going to continue to sort of have feel like we're in a safe pair of hands when we go and watch a show on X network, and for as much as there is a wild west of everything's on the internet, and there might be the most brilliant television show is only eight minutes an episode, and you find it somewhere on a YouTube channel. I kind of feel like that there is uh, a degree to which we're still giving over a lot of our trust to the networks, and for you know, and for the, for the large part, I feel like we get paid off by that. You guys think so too? Well, I think it's interesting. I think I think AMC is an interesting uh, example in, in that in that kind of uh, conversation to be had. I, I know that like, I, 
a, a point of mockery recently, light mockery on the site recently has been the show Turn on AMC, which I would guarantee that maybe 1% of people who write for Grantland have actually watched. Write for Grantland. <laughs> and, uh, but it's funny that there's a, there's a narrative about AMC just because of the troubles they've had with Breaking Bad and the troubles they've had with Mad Men and some of their, like, they have one of the biggest shows on cable right now with Walking Dead. But, the biggest, yeah. Yeah, but like for some reason the narrative that's been built up around AMC is that of, you know, kind of a schadenfreude type thing. And, uh, and so there's the kind of, the, the way that we talk about turn is just, I, I mean, it's probably unfair, but, you know, there's, there's, there's a way in which the writing and the conversation that's happen, uh, happening on the internet does filter what your priorities are going to be as a viewer. I should probably check out Turn, but it's like instantly I had this bias about it just because of the way people were talking about it on the internet. So, I'm also very interested in how event programming and shows like you know that do kind of foster these intense debates and conversations, how those are going to come together in a way that event programming won't just be musicals or won't just be something predictable, but also won't necessarily be something exploitative. They will have their own, create their own world, must be watched live, must involve people working together in real time, talking in real time. I think that that's kind of... That's, well, that's fascinating. What would be an did example Did I blow your mind? That? Yeah, no, no. Uh, Cosmos <laughs> or something like that? Cosmos is, is kind of what I'm thinking, but that's a niche, and I think there are infinite possibilities yeah. of, I mean, you can almost even think of it from a theatrical standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, going to see a play, how it's, it's live and you don't know what will happen. Everyone's experiencing it silently. Your mind is going, and it's, but it also has a tremendous amount of creative control. It's not something that's reality. It's not something that's shame watching. It's something that's smart, that is tailored to people who come together in you know, these very small groups to have conversations about similar interests. And so I you're think, almost looking for like a middle ground. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder what it would be like if Louis were, you know, you, you often think of things that are taped live as not being necessarily that right. forward thinking. But I think what would happen if, you know, Louis had an event show, right. for instance, no. or girls had an event show. Yeah, there's like, there's historical precedent, you know, obviously exactly. like the bedrock of TV is like Playhouse 90 and filming plays live and there are also, you know, there was a live episode of ER, I believe. Yeah, and yes. we did Failsafe, um, right? And mm -hmm. fail, yeah, George Clooney directed Failsafe. Yep. I mean, and you also think of... 30 Rock, too. Oh, yeah. And 30 Rock as well, that's exactly. right. Exactly. But it wouldn't have to be just... I think that you have to introduce an unexpected element for these things to actually work. I mean, Sound of Music, the unexpected element was why, kind or of. Or right. how would it actually look? How and it's why? It's been such a long time since we'd had anything like that. Exactly. But you think of how radio plays when, you know, when they had to adapt to a visual medium, the change was very gradual into what we then saw. And I think that what we're seeing now is that there, there still is a lot of room to evolve and to take advantage of people who are glued to a set and then they are glued to a second screen and they are having conversations, but they want to be surprised and not surprised because something horrible happened, surprised because they're being challenged. We all want to be challenged. Uh, that's probably a good place to uh, end this conversation. Thanks, guys. Thanks uh, very much. Thank thanks you. to the NCTAs Thank and to the cable show. Appreciate you having us and listening to us today. Thanks very much.